In a moment, it will still be the 18th of June, but the year will be 1621, and you will recently have arrived from England in the Virginia colony at Jamestown. It's now 14 years after the settlers landed with Captain John Smith in 1607. You, like the others, are seeking your fortune and a new future in this land called Virginia. One of the veteran settlers, John Rolfe, the husband of a well-known local girl, has come to greet you and orient you to your new home. Here he comes now, Master John Rolfe. John Rolfe, and um, I gather you have come aboard the ship and have arrived here uh, just this morning. And I greet you to your new home in the colony of Virginia. And if you don't mind, if you have a bit of time, I'll tell you something about this place. Well, when I arrived here over a decade ago, I had a great deal of curiosity with me as well. So um, uh, I don't think this should take more than about four or five hours. <laughs> oh, you. Well, all right, let us make it somewhat less than that. But I tell you about this place and what has gone on here in the early days for a reason. The more you know about what has gone on in this place, the more likely you'll be alive next year. I'd hope for a bit more enthusiasm than that. <laughs> uh, you see, uh, whether or not you desire your survival, there are those in England who want your survival, your friends and your family. You're left behind there. And, and there's, there's another group also, the investors of the Virginia Company who put forth a great deal of money to get you here. They want your survival. And I can explain that rather, rather quickly in the, in the fact that corpses work very poorly. All right, we need your labor, your knowledge and skills, talent, abilities. They're in short supply in this place. And so we want you alive, we, we need you alive, and we'll do our best to make that likely. But you must play your part. Uh, and, and what is our best tool to make more likely our survival? That resides somewhere up in here. Our brains, of course. But I know some brains that are not well filled, all right? And knowledge of the past uh, is essential for that brain to tell us what to do. So that, that, that is the importance of history, to understand what has gone before and to instruct us in, in the best choices for the future. And, and so I tell you a bit about the early days of this place. Um, now, I told you my name is John Rolfe, but uh, you may well know my wife's name better than you know mine. Any of you? Pocahontas was my wife. And I say was my wife rather than is my wife. For in this year of 16 and 21, sadly, she no longer lives. She perished some years ago on a journey we made to England. But um, certainly we can talk about her and her people and, and so forth. But um, I should tell you about this place you've come to. This Jamestown is the capital of the colony. And by some strange coincidence, our monarch's name is James. You might find that strange. And of course, this river is James also. We name things, of course, to honor our monarchs. This place, Virginia, Jamestown is the capital of the colony, but this place, Virginia, is a rather large place. This claim, this colony, was established in the 1580s by Sir Walter Raleigh, and it was named to honor his monarch. His monarch, Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen, so, Virginia for the Virgin Queen. All right, well, what is this Virginia? Well, well Virginia uh, is a rather large place. Uh, Virginia, according to Sir Walter Raleigh, is all to the north of the Spanish in their claim and colony, Florida, up the Atlantic coast until you get to the French, New France. Uh, and Virginia extends from the Atlantic on this side, west as far as the land doth go to the next ocean. Virginia extends from ocean, one ocean to the next. You see, Sir Walter Raleigh claimed on this side, the Atlantic side, and on the other side, 
Sir Francis Drake sailed up that coast and claimed for his monarch, Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. So this colony, Virginia, uh, this claim is a rather large place. We have no idea of what is between uh, in many cases. Uh, perhaps you'll find out. That is up to us now who have come later on. But um, claims are easy to make. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll teach you how to make a claim. You there, if you don't mind, say these words. I, I own, own the sun. There you are. <laughs> he owns the sun there. Now, you can start charging the rest of us for the light and the heat. That is, unless she disagrees. And he disagrees with your claim. Claims are easy to make. But unless you can possess with your feet your claim, your claim is of, of little value. All right? So this claim, Virginia, well, you can say anything you want. I'll tell you, before we English claimed this place, Virginia, the Spaniards claimed this place. And they called it by this name, A-J-A-C-A-N. A Hakan or something like that. Do any of you speak the language? Uh, would that be about an approximate? How would you, how would you pronounce A-J-A-C-A-N? There you are. Um, uh, this, this is her, not me. Uh, uh, Ahakan, that is what the Spaniards have claimed here as well. And they tried on two occasions to possess it. And they failed on two occasions to possess it. And so we English have stepped in to the claim. And we've decided to make this our claim. And the Spaniards have a word for you and me. Trespassers. All right? But we are determined to make this ours. We are determined to trespass. And when I say determined, you know what I'm talking about. Well, all right. Here we are. This is this Virginia colony. Well, I should tell you about the first arrivals here. That was some 14 years ago in 1607. That Captain John Smith and others came here upon three ships. The Susan Constant, the Godspeed, and the Discovery. They were those first three English ships that arrived at that time. Um, of course, in 14 years, there have been scores of ships to come here. Many ships. Every year, ships from England come here. But for the moment, let us talk about those first three. Um, on board were about um, 140 men and boys. No women, not at that time. Uh, there are women in large numbers in the colony now in 1621. Uh, but most of them have arrived here in the last two years, 16, 19, 20, 21. But in the first arrival, no women. In the second arrival, no women. In the third arrival, it was 16-8. Uh, there was a massive number of women, too. 100% more than one. But in the early years, never many of them. And um, uh, in that first arrival, of course, none. Well, of that 140, uh, only 104 stayed here as settlers. And why is that? Why did they not all stay? Any idea? Yeah. Well, there was that, of course. But uh, why was the... Well, they didn't know about that in the beginning. Why did they choose not to stay, some of them? Any ideas? Uh, ships perform poorly without a crew. All right? You're, you're thousands of miles from your home. You do want contact with your home. So, so some are mariners, of course. Well, don't wear, worry so much about numbers. I'm not so concerned about that myself. But of the 140, 104 stayed as settlers, and one of those who stayed here was a man by the name of Captain John Smith. No doubt you've heard that name before. All right? Well, um, I'll tell you the name of a settler who is here now who's been here for over a decade and who... Uh, did not arrive in that first arrival. This one here, I, John Rolf, arrived here three years later in the spring of 16 and 10. Glad I am I did. I wish I, I wish I didn't have to tell you about this next part. It brings me no pleasure at all. But it's only fair that you know about this. Most of those who arrived here in 167, 168, 16.9, 9, 
They're in the dirt round here and you walked on them already today. By the hundreds, they're in the dirt. They perished in large numbers. As a matter of fact, more died than lived. Uh, six months after that first 104 arriving here, six months later, half of them were dead. And then it got bad. The worst was the winter of 1609 to 1610. Uh, the, 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 the end of the year of 1609, they started with about 500 settlers. About 500. Do any of you know how many survived the winter and were alive with the beginning of the spring of 1610? About 60. Can you do your mathematics? You seem not much moved by that. Do you have a, a stone where your heart should be? 440 of 500 perished in one winter. This was tragic. It was awful here. Uh, they died of all sorts of things. No doubt you wonder why. Uh, they, uh, one, of one thing, uh, they died in large numbers. Uh, it was, uh, well, uh, illness. Uh, in the early days, fevers were, were commonplace. Many died of illness. Uh, there was... Uh, as many died of, of injury, one sort or another. I'll tell you something else of which they died. What? Arrows, indeed. Not ours. Uh, I should tell you something about this. Did I tell you who I married? I, I did, I think. Did I not? All right. Now, I'm not talking about you. This has nothing to do with you. But in theory, is it possible that anyone could have a problem with their in-laws? <laughs> Has it ever happened? Do you know who my in-laws became? People who didn't care a whit about our claim of Virginia in their land. You see a problem there? There's a great problem there. Well, there was a great deal of fighting in those early days. The, 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 the Powhatan Indians, they thought this land belonged to them. And their only reason for that is they'd been here possessing it for thousands of years. And they were willing to make a point of that. No, no as you did say, many points. And they came right toward us. Many English died. Many Indians died in those years of fighting. There were seven years of slaughter in this place. But you need not fear the Powhatan Indians. Do, do not fear them. Uh, there's no cause for you to have concern about them now. Not now, 14 years after we've arrived here. And there's one reason why. My marriage to Pocahontas. In April of 16 and 14, when I married Pocahontas, uh, her father, the great king, the great Powhatan, he said, no more fighting. Uh, let me tell you, the man might not look like a king to you. He is dressed less well than a, a beggar on the street of London. It doesn't matter. They, they don't have cloth. They go around naked in the summertime. Uh, to the waist, men and the women wear nothing. In the back, back here, nothing. Only in the front, an apron of the skin of an animal. But one of those poorly dressed men, to his people, is a king. You might not regard him so, but he is a king. Um, and uh, when his daughter... Uh, upon her, her choice, married me, uh, he said, no more fighting. We are now allies. We, we will have no, no more killing here. So we now have had seven years of peace. But that was preceded by the worst of the killing you can imagine. Many Indians died, many English died. But that is over. So uh, I was talking about the, the reasons for all those deaths. Uh, there was um, illness, there was injury, there was fighting. Uh, one more. I'll give you one more. And this perhaps killed more than any other single thing. Indeed. Starvation. Not enough to eat. How many of you, given the choice, would prefer to eat at least once a week or more? <laughs> We're much alike, are we not? All right. What if you could not eat so often as that? Well, uh, what prevents starvation? What is food? Not dirt, not stones, animals, plants, they will sustain your life. Well, obviously, these early settlers who wished to live as much as you and I wish to live, 
must not have found any animals or plants in this colony. My friends, this colony of Virginia is a paradise. This, there are animals and plants everywhere you turn. You're living in a place of abundance here. There's no shortage of food. Well, how can you possibly die of starvation in the middle of all this food? They found a way, all right? Well, they weren't looking for the way. Have you not encountered things in your life that you were not looking for? That is the nature of life. All right, so they found a way to starve in the middle of food. One reason they starved was um, at the time they did come here, uh, there was a drought, insufficient rain, and your crops do not prosper and so forth with that. But that is, that is and cannot be the only reason they starved. Because the Powhatan Indians are farmers also. And their crops require rain. And they were not dying of starvation to the same degree the English were. So it had to be more than that. It had to be more than lack of rain. But I'll give you that, lack of rain. Another reason they starved in the middle of food was, well, we've talked about this before. Uh, uh, that conflict with the native people there. Hostile neighbors in those early years if you ventured beyond the, the security of the three walls of the palisaded fort, you, you were uh, risking your life. You might live and you might not. Many collected arrows in their chest just outside the fort. For the, for the grass round the fort was rather high and the Powhatans would snake through that grass, right up to the fort. Uh, about an acre and a half within the enclosure, if, if there were... Uh, uh, 50 settlers alive, all lived in, in the fort. If there were 500 alive, all lived in the fort. If there were 20,000, all lived in the acre and a half. At that time, anyone who lived was in that triangle of the palisade. Well, all right. Uh, so uh, you might venture into the fort, uh, outside the fort, uh, into the forest for, for food, and you might kill a deer, and everyone feast upon venison for the evening. But the next time you went outside the fort, beyond the security, you might not come back. Now your screams might come back for several hours. But if you want to know about that, ask someone else. I don't want to talk about it. It has something to do with people who thought the land was theirs. All right, so we have now um, uh, lack of rain. We have hostile neighbors. Another reason they couldn't feed themselves in the midst of a great deal of food was this. They'd sent here the wrong type of settlers, all right? Uh, uh, they had carefully selected, prior to the trip, the wrong type of settler. Not for failure, but for success. Uh, but when you're venturing into the unknown, uh, there is unknown. And you must speculate, you must wonder, you must plan, you must do all those things. But at a certain point, you must stop doing that. You must gamble and go. Have all of your choices worked out just as you had hoped? Everyone? If you say I, you haven't lived very long. Some of our gambles do not work out, and this one for them did not. I'll tell you why, uh, perhaps later on. We haven't the time right at the moment, but let me get beyond that. They'd selected the wrong type of settler, and here's who they were. Gentlemen, 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 group of gentlemen traveling together. Gentlemen, gentlemen, carpenter. You might need one of those. Gentlemen, gentlemen, laborer. Might need one of those. You take my meaning. There were many gentlemen and hardly anything else. Now, I don't know what you know about gentlemen, but they are the type who'd rather not get their hands dirty. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, if there's work to be done, they'd rather you do it. All right, so uh, that was the worst type of settler to have in such a place as this. But there was a reason, perhaps we'll talk about that later on, in the 15th hour of our talk. All right, so, uh, uh, so are you adding these up? Uh, lack of rain, hostile neighbors, the wrong type of settler. I'll give you one more. This is the nail in the coffin. I've got to stop saying that. I'm sorry. Oh, that is a bit too severe. Uh, the most important and perhaps deadly reason that they could not survive in the midst of food was this. The plan they had for feeding themselves was not a good one. Whatever plan you're using seems to be working quite well. 
But their plan was not so good. Their plan, part of it was this. Load the ships in England, sail across the Atlantic, unload the stores, go back for more. Now, how long does it take to sail across the Atlantic one way? Long time, certainly, might be well more than that. It, it might even take you three months, four months, five, six, seven, eight months. I, I can't tell you the answer. There is none. I, I've written a poem about this, not a good one. I'm not a good poet, but uh, I felt moved to write this poem, and I've uh, memorized this for this occasion. I don't want to waste my efforts. So I'm going to we give you my poem, all right? I, I'm going to impose it upon you. Here's my poem. It has to do with the length of time it takes to cross the Atlantic one way. All right, I need to give it a name. If the wind ain't blowing, you ain't going, all right? There it is, there's no more. There's... No, 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 it doesn't deserve that. I, I know the reality of it. Uh, 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 that is a couplet, if you like poetry, all right? Uh, I don't like poetry, as you can tell. But it does have merit. It speaks about reality. Your sails of cloth are fine, but they better be filled with a bit of breeze. Sometimes you have breeze. Sometimes you don't, all right? You get what you get. You can want rain. You can want the rain to stop. It's been raining here for several days. I want the rain to stop. But I get what I get. We talked about Captain John Smith and his trip across the Atlantic, all right? We spoke, did we not? Uh, he arrived here on the 13th of May of 1675. Fine, all right? We've established that. What was his date of departure from England? Anyone know? The 20th of December of 1606. Now, if you wish to know the length of his journey, calculate for yourself. From the 20th of December until the 13th of May. There you are. You can tell me as, as well as I can tell you. Now, with that date in mind, the 20th of December, with that date in mind, listen to this. Six weeks, a month and a half, after Smith and the others left England, they were still within sight of England. They had sailed hundreds of yards in a month and a half. Wouldn't you have hoped for a bit better than that? I think I, I would have wanted more. Well, you understand my poem. That's a reality. Can you imagine yourself incarcerated in a floating wooden box called a ship within sight of your home for a month and a half? Might that affect your attitude? Might you break into precious supplies on board ship during that month and a half? And finally, when you get the proper wind you need, you make your arduous journey across the Atlantic with your new attitude. All right? Wow, that's a reality. I'll tell you something, though. Captain John Smith's journey across the Atlantic was a pleasure cruise compared to the one I had three years later. We're not going to talk about that right now, but mine was difficult and long by comparison. And our problem was not the lack of wind, it was too much. We encountered a hurricane in the midst of the Atlantic. Let me tell you, that is a problem, but we won't talk about that right now. But there it is. The reason I brought that up, the reason I said anything at all about such things as this, is if the length of time between the arrivals of the supply ships is separated by time long enough, if your arrival of the supply ship may, may be here today and then another one in three days, that's not so bad. Three days is nothing. Three weeks, oh, not so bad, but it might be three months. It might be uh, uh, three years. It might be 30 years. Who knows? There's no certainty about such things as this. Uh, how long can you go without a meal? All right? And if that length of time is sufficiently long, even a gentleman might be willing to get his hands dirty. All right? You might be inspired. I hope you're never inspired by hunger. But hunger can inspire you to action. No, oh, it, it can. All right, let, let us say you're inspired. You're here, you're, you're hungry, you're inspired to, to leave the security of the port on this particular occasion. You make it to the river without dying, without being killed. Uh, you catch a fish, uh, you, uh, you cook it, you eat it, uh, you feel oh so much the better. Oh, 
so much better. Well, you feel better until your fellows find out what you did. Doing that might cause you to be executed. You may be put to death for doing that because you broke the rule. The rule says all food produced in the colony goes into the common storehouse from which all are fed equally. It wasn't your fish. It was our fish and properly should have been subdivided in equal portions by the total number of settlers in the colony. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, however there are many, by that number you subdivide the food that has been produced. So it wasn't your fish. And I'll tell you something. Um, I, I think uh, if, uh, if you got your proper portion of the fish, I don't know if you can see this, but I think subdivided properly in equal portions, that is your part of your fish. Is that much fish going to keep you alive a long time? Is that much fish worth the labor and the danger of acquiring it? So said the gentleman. Not me. Not me. Of course not you. You're a gentleman. I'm not going to tell you that no work was done. I'm going to tell you the work that was done was insufficient for survival. And so they died. The question is not why 440 died. The question is, how did 60 live? That is the question. And I, I think a part of the answer is this. Um, uh, even before that awful winter of, of 1609 to 1610, where so many were dying, uh, e even in the early days, I can give you one word that, that caused not everyone to die. Charity. Charity from an unexpected source. Charity from the Powhatan Indians, and one in particular, a girl by the name of Pocahontas. There you are. Pocahontas brought food to the starving settlers and no doubt saved many of them. Not all of them. That evil girl, she should have been more generous, don't you think? Well, oh, these gentlemen who wouldn't work. Pocahontas saved this colony. I don't know what you know about Pocahontas. Have any, I ought to speak about this. Have any of you come here with uh, uh, some knowledge of the romance that took place between Captain John Smith and Pocahontas? Have you heard of that? All right. Have, have uh, any of you heard of the romance between Captain John Smith and Cleopatra? Oh, you haven't heard that? Both are just as likely to have taken place. There was no romance between Captain John Smith and Pocahontas. That is absurd. In the year of his arrival, 16 and 7, Pocahontas was an elderly woman of 10 years. All right? Now, Smith was here for two and a half years. A massive number, all right? For some strange reason, Pocahontas aged a year every year. It might happen to you, all right? Now, can you do your mathematics, count on your fingers, uh, do it, or do it in your head if you can do that. You might know how, how old she was when he left here, all right? When he departed this place. Well, there you are. She was a, a girl at that time, a small and young person, but a brave, intelligent, uh, and uh, a curious person. Pocahontas saved this colony, and she did so as a young person. You don't have to become an adult before you do good and great and important things. All right, well, all right, so Pocahontas saved this colony. No doubt she did. Well, um, here's a question for you. Should you live by charity if you don't have to? I mean, no, they haven't sent the wrong type of settlers again, have they? <laughs> you do know the answer to, you, to that, do you not? All right, you, you must pull your weight if you can. All right? Well, how do you get these gentlemen who do not wish to labor to do labor? Well, there are two classic ways. The carrot and the stick. Known well to the farmer who needs the labor of his horse to pull the plow. All right, fine, the carrot and the stick. Both were used upon these these gentlemen settlers. And the first to be applied was the stick. Now, what do I mean by the stick? Well, I should tell you about that. Captain John Smith 
Uh, you may come here with another illusion in mind, beyond the marriage or the love or the romance of Smith and Pocahontas, which did, which did not happen. You might presume also that Captain John Smith was the first leader of this colony. Also not true. When Captain John Smith arrived here on one of those ships on the 13th of May of 1607, he was in irons. He was shackled. The man was a prisoner and he was to be executed when they got him here to the colony. He was not the leader. He was a low-born man and had committed a crime according to his accusers. Uh, and so he was not the leader. He was, had he, had he not been a prisoner, he was the lowest, he was one of the lowest born men aboard that, that arrival. All right? In that arrival. So he was not the first leader. The first leader was a high born gentleman, and I know you're surprised to hear that. Uh, uh, and this first high born gentleman was a man by the name of Edward Maria Wingfield. All right? Now, I have bad news for you. Not all fishermen are equal, not all shoemakers are equal, and not all leaders are equal. And if your leader is insufficient to the job, you might be led into a grave. It has happened before, it will happen again. And many were led into a grave under the leadership of Wingfield. So they got another leader. They elected a different one. A man by the name of Radcliffe. Uh, well, I take that back. He came here with an alias. His name was Sicklemore, but we'll talk about that in the 35th hour of that talk. All right, so, um, uh, I, I know you're surprised to hear he was a high-born gentleman also. All right? Many died during the time of Radcliffe. So they got another one. For a short time, there was a man by the name of Scrivener. Finally, finally, out of desperation, they brought from down here Captain John Smith, the low-born man to lead the high-born gentleman. And my friends, that is uncommon. That should shock you and surprise you, that a low-born man was leading the high-born. Well, they did not bring him to lead by, by, uh, through love. They brought him to, to lead out of desperation, out of need. You might not have loved Smith if you knew Captain John Smith. Let me give him to you in a few words. He was arrogant, boastful, aggressive, intelligent, uh, uh, experienced. You take my meaning? The mind had strengths and weaknesses, flaws and virtues. Humans do, you know. All right? Well, they needed what he could do for them. So they called him out of desperation from way down here to lead. And so he, he came before them in, a, in, in that first meeting and he uh, used the stick on them. And here's what I mean by the stick. He said this. Unlike those who led before me, I care not who you are. It means nothing to me. Whether you're a gentleman, a laborer, a merchant, a carpenter, I care not. If you put nothing into the common store through your labors, you as an individual will get nothing out to eat. He who will not work shall not eat. And that was the stick, my friends. And by the stick, what was produced? Well, what resulted? Survival. They began to survive. Now, now, I'm all for survival. I, I think it is a vital and important thing. It is fundamental. However, we need more. All right. Uh, let me try a quick experiment here. It won't take long. Upon the count of three, I wish for you to attempt to survive. One, two, three. I'll give you some time here. Well done, well done. No one died. I see no corpses out there. Uh, you survived. But how much during that time was produced for the investors who put forth the money to bring us here to this place? Not a great deal. Of course we need your survival. We need more than that. All right? And so, uh, after Smith had gone back to England, he'd left here, there were other governors. There was a governor of who began in, in uh, 1611 by the name of Sir Thomas Dale. Dale now was more severe with a stick than Smith was. He was the most severe governor we have ever had. But he was a wise man and a just man, and so he said the stick doesn't bring us enough. We need to add to the stick the carrot. And what do I mean by the carrot? I'll tell you. Uh, 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 Sir Thomas Dale said this. 
if you, right there, if you uh, um, uh, take nothing from the common storehouse for your needs and the needs of your family, that three acres belongs to you. If you choose the same, that three acres is yours. If you choose the same, that three acres is yours. Three acres was offered to all who would not take from the common store. And in one growing season, it was obvious. Those who continued to eat from the common store, nothing was different. Those who chose to eat from their own three acres were well fed. Is this magic? You want me to make my hat disappear? There's no magic. There's reality and illusion. And the reality is humans will work harder if they expect they will profit proportionate to their labor. Too difficult for you. Um, <laughs> humans have such a difficult time understanding this concept. I'll give it another way. Work more, eat more. Got that? Yeah. Work less, eat less. Got that? All right. That's your magic, my friends. And let me tell you, back in England, they were heartily pleased to get some good news for a change. They've been getting bad news and wailing and crying and complaints and reports of death. Now they were hearing, uh, we're finding out how to feed ourselves. <laughs> they were heartily pleased to get that good news. And so the Virginia Company and its investors, they built upon this success, upon the idea of the three acres. They built their own idea. They built it bigger. And they built something called the Headright System. Have any of you heard of the Headright System? Anyone here? All right, well, I'll tell you. Headright means it was costing the investors of the Virginia Company uh, 10 to 13 uh, pounds uh, of cost to get one settler, one head, from England over to the colony of Virginia. All right? Whether he lived or died when he got here. Did they all live? No. Most did not. There's no profit for the investors in planting, paying to plant a corpse in America. I assure you. They've lost their money. And so they were looking for a way to populate the colony without spending a great deal of money. And the headright system was that way. The headright system uh, says this here. If you pay your way, if you pay your own cost of transit over here to the colony and do not rely upon the investors, then when you get here, you don't get three acres. You get... You get 50. Now I challenge you to find in England for sale uh, for 12 or 13 pounds, 50 acres. You won't. You won't. Land is dear. And in England, only the few own all the land, and the rest owned nothing. All right. Well, it, it goes further. Uh, if you pay for the arrival of a second head, another, another person coming with you, uh, uh, another 50 acres, a wife perhaps, an indentured servant to work your property with you. Uh, do you know that woman sitting next to you there? You do? Is she here at your expense? Oh, uh, uh, wait, is he here at your expense? <laughs> One of you gets the, the extra, you'll have a hundred acres, one of you. Well, there you are. Uh, each head you fund to arrive in this place, you get 50 acres. And now, my friends, this land is subdivided into private property, and there's no more Star Basin. If you wanted to stop, you should have come a long time ago. I'm sorry, we don't have that anymore. All we have for you now is abundance. There's no excuse for starving in such a place as this. All right, well, we've gotten beyond that. But just as a body can die from lack of food, uh, animals and plants, so too can an enterprise die for lack of its food. What is the food of an enterprise business? A profit. You can't feed your enterprise a loss every year. If you're a farmer and you throw a great deal of labor open the soil up, and you invest into the soil 10,000 seeds. And your seeds grow and you have a harvest. Everyone loves the harvest. And you reap in your harvest 7,000 seeds. Is that a good year? You've lost 3,000. 
You can't do that every year. You can't feed your enterprise a loss every year. It will starve and die. It will be gone. You have to have a profit for your labors or don't labor. If you're laboring without a profit, just die, but don't die with labor. All right? You must have a profit for your labors. Well, there it is. And these investors were not making a profit. They had a loss year by year by year. You can't do that forever. In, in what particular form, what form were they expecting their profit? Do you know? Anyone? Uh, I'll give you a, a, a hint. Silver and gold, all right? Uh, the desire for that is not new. It's been around for at least five or ten minutes. Humans have wanted gold for as long as we can know about humans. It, it is a common thing. It is not unusual. All right, now, um, wanting gold or silver and expecting gold or silver is a different thing. I, I can assure you right now, I, I'm not jesting with you, I can assure you that I want, in the next 10 seconds, my hands filled with gold coins. I do. Do you doubt me? Anyone doubt me? I want that. But do I expect that? I don't. I don't expect it because I know something of history. It is history that informs us as to expectations and what our choices should be. So, so. These early investors not only wanted gold and silver, they expected it. And why is that? From who? Those Catholic Spaniards. All right, we've opened a can of worms here now. I'm going to be candid with you, all right? Keep this to yourself, all right? Don't, don't pass this on. I don't want my friends knowing I've said anything in behalf of the, of the Catholic Spaniards, all right? Just keep it to yourself. I'm going to be candid with you, though. We have, have now been here for 14 years. We've survived for 14 years. And let me tell you, we have enormous pride about that, more than I can possibly tell you. We failed in, in the 1580s with the lost colony with Raleigh, and now we've started at Jamestown, and we have 14 years here now. We're proud of that. But the Spaniards, like them or not, began their success in this place in 1492. Not 1607. 1492. It is the Spaniards who are the great success in America. Like it or not, they've been successful for many years. In the Caribbean, all right? In the Caribbean. For uh, many years, decades, they have been finding native people with silver and gold, and they've been plundering those native people, all right? Taking the silver and gold. They load it aboard their treasure ships and send it back to Spain. Now, not all of it gets to Spain. Um, great English heroes such as Sir Francis Drake and Hawkins and Frobisher and Newport and many others make sure some of that gold and silver is uh, redirected to England, if you know what I'm talking about. Wait a minute, they're only Spanish Catholics, all right? Uh, hey, we're not the only ones who do that. The Dutch do it. The French do it, and some of them are Catholic. Doesn't that bring a, a, a smile to your face? Catholics plundering Catholics. <laughs> well, all right. Um, well, uh, um, um, I'm not justifying plunder. I'm not suggesting it. I'm not recommending it. But the Spaniards plundered the Indians, all right? It wasn't their gold and silver. The, the Indians plunder each other. Now, I, I've been told, someone told me the other day, I, I, I had to uh, answer him about this. He said, um, we Europeans, we're, we're, we, we lack so much virtue. We take from the native people, and, and they have virtue. It is the natives who have the virtue. Well, let me tell you something. Uh, let me speak about my father-in-law. You know who that was? We talked about that. My father-in-law, indeed, the great king of the native people here, the Powhatans. Um, my father-in-law, Powhatan, when he wanted the land of the Piankatanks and the uh, uh, Chesapeake to the east, he sent his warriors over there and slaughtered their warriors, took their women and their children and their land. 
Sounds like a European monarch to me. <laughs> My friends, here is the point. Kings are kings are kings, and they do as they will and as they can. I'm not justifying that. I'm telling you. That is the reality of it. Uh, uh, there's the reality. Kings do as they will and as they can, whoever they are. Humans are humans are humans. When they have sufficient power, they use it. Well, all right, so, um, but the point is this. The reason I brought this up at all, the English had good reason to suspect, not only suspect, they knew there was gold and silver in America. Not only wanted it, they knew they could expect it. So here we come in 1607 to Jamestown. And uh, by the way, that explains why we sent gentlemen. Because the success of Spain was not in sending carpenters and laborers. They had sent second sons from high-born families. Eldest son got the inheritance. The second sons were good with their swords. And they plundered. And so there it is. We English knew history. And we applied what we knew and set the successful type, the, 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 the settlers we expected to be successful based upon the Spanish success. And that was gentlemen. That is why we said gentlemen. The problem is, when they got here to Jamestown, they found that the Powhatan Indians, they don't have any gold or silver to take. Oh, this is, this is bad. No gold and silver. The investors were not pleased to hear the news, I can assure you. Well, they sent the wrong type of settler over here. And the, the word from England uh, coming back to us from the investors was, um, do you want us to continue sending you, you food and supplies? What do you think the answer was? Oh, oh do send us more. Uh, do you want us to continue sending you new settlers? You can't seem to keep the ones we, we send you alive. You want more of those also? It was always send more, send more, send more. Uh, and the investors said, all right. Then you send us something in return of value. And so, uh, over here, uh, they, they, try, they tried all sorts of things. They tried wine making, they tried silk making, they tried uh, glass making, they tried uh, timber from the trees, they tried uh, uh, pitch and tar from the swamps and so forth. All that sort of thing went back on the ships uh, to England. But understand, the value of that going back did not equal the amount being spent by the investors upon us. Just like the farmer who received less seeds than he planted, the investors were going broke. They were losing their enterprise, their money, their investment. Uh, and uh, uh, sooner or later, they were saying, uh, you lost my money last year. You lost my money the year before that. Uh, I have no more money to waste upon the colony of Virginia. Abandon that place. Give North America to the Spaniards, the Dutch, the French. Who cares? And so they were planning to abandon this place. They were talking about that, and that was the likely course of action. And I, John Rolfe, I stepped forward. I had my say. And I, John Rolfe, uh, said, um, you lack perseverance. You wanted your gold. I found your gold. Golden leaves, they, they grow green and they dry golden brown. You know what I'm talking about? Tobacco. tobacco. I'll give you another word for tobacco. Uh, and that is, uh, I'm talking a, a great too long time, am I not? Very good. Uh, I, I shan't go more than about another three hours. All right, <laughs> thank you for that. All right, I know you, you won't stay for that long. But, but the point is, tobacco can be seen also by another word. Profit. I'll give you another word for tobacco. Life. Life for the colony, not death by abandonment of the colony. And my friends, we have not abandoned. Here we yet are. In this year of 1641, we've not abandoned because of tobacco. One last thing. I appreciate that comment about the time. Uh, I do go on. Um, well, um, here's a comment uh, I, I must say about uh, tobacco. Tobacco is a plant that is native to America. Before Christopher Columbus came here for Spain in 1492, there was no tobacco in Europe. Only in America 
cultivated by the native people for, who knows, hundreds, thousands of years, who knows how long. All right, in a like manner, we English have brought here and planted, two years ago as a matter of fact, a unique English plant. Put it in the soil, the seed for it was put in the soil two years ago in 1619. You know what I'm talking about, anyone? I'll tell you, unique to England. The General Assembly, out of a parliament. Uh, 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 the, the General Assembly is the governor, the governor's council upon which I, I sit, I, John Rolfe, sit on the governor's council of state, and the elected, I said elected Burgesses. You know we're not Spaniards. You know we're not French. There's no election in Paris, France. There's no parliament in Madrid, Spain. Only in England have we conducted our government for a, a long time in a particular way. And uh, of what do I speak? Uh, you have to go back to 1215. That, that was a few years ago, my friends, 1215. And uh, to a place called Runnymede, where good King John was greeted by his loyal subjects. <laughs> and King John said, uh, uh, they said to King John, uh, King John, you're a great English king. <laughs> and you'll, you'll remain the type of English king who has a head on his shoulders without having it severed off now if you sign this document. Uh, and for some reason he signed. Uh, that great charter, the Magna Carta, uh, had within it the seed of something called Parliament. And Parliament is nothing more nor less than we subjects electing our own, making our own laws, and helping our monarchs to rule. We insist upon it. <laughs> we insist upon it. Well, there it is. There's no such help given to the Spanish king or the French king. It is unique to, to we English. And, uh, well, enough. Uh, this little Parliament that we have here now is growing well and watered by the profits of tobacco. Uh, but I must leave you uh, now for, uh, I have other obligations and I know you do as well. And um, as I leave you, I do want to say this. We who've come here before you, we wish you good health and long life. All right, we do want that for you. And because of the knowledge I've given you, this history of the early uh, colony, your chances are better. Um, we also wish you uh, prosperity, good fortune. Since tobacco, that is not an idle wish, it is a reality. You can have that now. And, uh, and one more thing. We wish you perseverance. For with your perseverance and your hard work and mine, there might be a colony called Virginia next year and the year after. We would like to be here in yet a hundred years, in 1721, if you can imagine the future. Well enough, if I should see you this time next year, I do hope you're alive and above ground. Good day to you. Thank you, Master John Rolfe. Thank you, Master John Rolfe. <clears throat> Our uh, John Rolfe this afternoon is historian Dick Cheatham. Uh, this is actually going to continue on um, if you want to stay. If not, no big deal. Um, a Dick Cheatham is a direct descendant of Pocahontas and John Rolfe 14 generations later. Um, that makes him a grandson of the great chief Powhatan, too. Uh, he is a professional speaker, historian, writer, and former television journalist who revives important parts of our incomparable American history through memorable and historically, historically accurate portrayals of people from the past. His presentations have been seen by hundreds of thousands of people from corporate executives to students all across the United States, in Europe, and even at sea on cruises. His passion is demonstrating the relevance and value of history's lessons for us today. Fundamental human nature does not change and thus we really don't have to make the same mistakes that have been made millions of times before. Dick will now return to answer your questions. Dick. Thank you very much uh, for uh, 
persevering through that long presentation. And uh, I happen to see some more uh, uh, relatives here. I, I see another descendant of, of uh, Powhatan uh, sitting there, my cousin, Nona. <laughs> It is, uh, it's great to be up here, um, and uh, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is, uh, is showing how history is relevant to our decision making today. And the reason it's relevant is because human nature hadn't changed. I'm sorry, humans, humans solve problems, they approach challenges in the very same way now and then. We're not different, they were not less intelligent, they were not less moral. Uh, they simply didn't know the science and the history we know. Now, we have an advantage in knowing the history, but we frequently put it in the trash can. Sadly, we don't have to fail in the same ways humans have failed over and over again. Let me read you something real quickly. Uh, it won't take long, but I, I think this, you might really enjoy this if I can find the right one. I think this is it. Um, this was... Uh, this was written by uh, a friend of John Rolfe's. His name was Ralph Hammer, H-A-M-O-R. And um, he was reflecting upon the transition between the common storehouse and private property, okay? He was reflecting on that change that had happened in the colony. And these are the actual words of Ralph Hammer, who was in the colony of Virginia. Formerly, when our people were fed out of the common store, and labored jointly in the manuring of the ground and planting corn, glad was that man that could slip from his labor. Nay, the most honest of them in a general business would not take so much faithful and true pains in a week as now he will do in a day. Neither cared they for the increase, presuming howsoever their harvest prospered, the general store must maintain them by which means we reap not so much corn from the labors of 30 men as three men have done for themselves. Does this surprise you? It is the way humans are built. You can fight against it. You can wish it weren't true. You can do anything you want, but it will persevere. It, is, it has not changed. It is that way. People are inspired by the carrot, and they're afraid of the whip, the stick. It's just the way we are. It's not, not weird or strange. And uh, the real strangeness is why the pilgrims, by the way, who came 13 years later, oh, I should mention something more about that, um, why did they use the common storehouse concept? They should have known better. They starved also until they gave private plots to individuals to feed themselves, and then they didn't have a problem. This why do we have to learn this lesson over and over again? Humans have a fundamental human nature that needs to be accounted for. And that's why I bring it up. That's why I mentioned that. Uh, I should mention the fact that, uh, that uh, we speak all over the country, but we have a contract on the island there at Jamestown where this actually took place. And it's exciting to have that opportunity to be there. It's magical to be there on the ground where Captain John Smith and Pocahontas walked and all that. Um, uh, and also where archaeology is going on right now. And they have found Captain John Smith's fort in only recent years. And they're digging up. Every day they dig, they find artifacts that are 400 years old. It's, it's just amazing. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a birthday celebration back in 2007. Um, what is it? 16, 7, 2007? How many years? Can you do your math in your head? 400 year birthday. That's a big one, 400 years. And at this big celebration, the president came, the Supreme Court came, hundreds of thousands of people from across the country, and no, across, around the globe came. Matter of fact, I remember um, there was a gal from uh, England who came, and she brought her husband. Her husband's name was Phil, and her name was Liz. You know Liz and Phil? She wears a crown over there. Why was the Queen, Queen of England in Jamestown in, six, uh, in, 2000, in 2007? Well, because uh, it was the beginning of the British Empire that eventually circled the globe. The, it was the first successful colony outside the British Isles, numero uno, first one. Um, why was the president there? Well, it was to honor the fact that the United States of America started from that seed. Yeah, true, but most Americans don't know that. 
Most Americans think that America begins when the pilgrims land at Plymouth Rock in 1620. Well, my friend, seven comes before 20. I'm sorry. The people at Jamestown turned a claim, ha having been made by Raleigh in the 1580s, into a possession through their blood, sweat, and tears. They didn't do it at no cost, let me tell you. The cost was massive. They turned a claim into a possession, and so the pilgrims didn't land in a claim only. They landed in Eng an English possession, not a Spanish claim or Spanish possession, an English possession because of the people at Jamestown. So it is wrong to deny the contributions of those who made it all possible, who were the first. Why, Amer why do Americans not know their founding story? Well, it has to do with, with, uh, with historians, people like me. Uh, why do they get it wrong? Well, they're teachers and they're professors and, they're, and, they're, and journalists and politicians. I want to warn you about experts. The, the experts here, the experts at home, the experts in Washington, anywhere there's an expert. I want to warn you about them. One, they don't know everything. Two, they make mistakes. Three, they have opinions. I'm that way, you're that way, that's the way it is. And that's how the story got warped and changed. Uh, Jamestown was well known as the beginning of the United States in the early years of the United States. The book said that. Something big must have happened in the 1860s. Did anything big happen in the history of this country in the 1860s? Can you think of anything that happened? Oh, there was a conflict? Did one side win or one side lose? The winners write the history. And in the 1870s, when the new histories were written about this country, this happened to Jamestown, and this happened to the pilgrims. Are you surprised? That is the way it works. So you can't, you can't uh, go toward history or look at history without some level of skepticism. I didn't tell you the story of Jamestown here. I told you the story based upon what I know of, the story of John Rolfe. But what if I had told you the story of Jamestown from the perspective of a Spaniard? What if I had told you the story of Jamestown from the perspective of a Powhatan Indian? Would it have sounded the same? Not likely. Uh, so you see, you really have to look at history uh, in a critical and skeptical way. Because people who didn't know it all, who made mistakes, and who had opinions wrote it, who created it. And their preferences were what you got to hear about. All right? On uh, Saturday, I'm doing a program I'm, I'm going to portray... Uh, 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 an American president who I think is very important, uh, but who most uh, historians or scholars think is unimportant. That's because my values and their values are not identical. Um, I judge people differently than they judge people and judge their accomplishments and their choices in a different way. So, so um, anyway, that's the way you need to look at history, especially people who, who are uh, uh, people who love liberty, who, who, uh, who believe strongly in the, in the, the moral uh, uh, virtue of the, the free market um, uh, and the efficiency of it and so forth. Um, you really can't accept the judgments of others in all cases. That's, that's a, a given. We all know that's true. But too often we do that. As a culture, we, we, we say, well, obviously, this, this president's better than that one, that one, because the, the scholar said so. The scholar doesn't have your values. I'm sorry, that's the way it works. Um, so uh, be skeptical and judge and, and ask questions. If it doesn't sound right, go to the original sources, go to the archaeology. We're learning things about the archaeology now that's really cool. Uh, uh, we're learning that some of the textbooks are wrong about X, Y, or Z, whatever it is. Uh, I'm wearing a couple of items that I have... Uh, Acquired. They've made copies of some of the of the artifacts that they've found. This is a um, well. I'll show you. After lunch, sometimes you have stuff in your teeth and you have to get it out. It's a toothpick. It's a silver gentleman's toothpick that was dropped and th they found it. I'm wearing a ring here. This ring uh, is a signet ring, um, uh, and it was dropped and they found that. And I've ha have a copy of it. Um, in those days, they didn't have envelopes. If they wrote a letter, they folded it, they, they melted wax on it, and they stuck their signet or their sign, uh, uh, signature, if you will, uh, to, 
to seal it and also to tell whose it was. You know, and uh, this was William Strachey's signet ring, and John Rolfe knew William Strachey. He, he knew him very well. Uh, I, I talked about uh, the fact that, that uh, uh, John Rolfe's journey across the Atlantic was more difficult than Captain John Smith's. Well, they ran into a hurricane in the middle of the Atlantic, and they were wrecked on Bermuda for months. No, nobody died. Um, you know, that was an amazing thing that no one died. They knew they were dead in the hurricane, uh, but then they wrecked on Bermuda. And uh, for months, they built two new ships, uh, the Patience and the Deliverance. Good names, right? Um, and those, on those new ships, from the wreckage of the Sea Venture and, and from what they found on Bermuda, they made it to Jamestown, finally. And uh, uh, they were so glad to get there. Can you imagine how glad they were to get there? Well, guess what? They landed at the time of the end of that awful starving time in the winter of 1609 to 10. These people coming from Bermuda were hoping to be saved by the people at Jamestown. The people at Jamestown were living skeletons, the 60 who had survived, and they saw ships coming. Oh, they're going to save us. Each one thought the other was going to save the other. You can, you can, they were bad times, very challenging times. Well, anyway, um, uh, this, the, the thing about the ring, I, I'll, I won't go on and on about this. I know that they don't, don't want me to keep you too long. You won't stay, obviously. But um, as far as the ring, uh, one of the coolest things about this, um, William Strachey was in that wreck. He finally got here uh, uh, to America. And what do you do if your family thinks you're dead? Well, as soon as you can, you contact them and say, I'm not dead. I'm alive. I survived. And so Strachey wrote this long letter in great detail about the hurricane and, and the time on Bermuda and, and finally getting to Virginia and all this kind of stuff in there, multi-page letter. And he sent it to his family, uh, sealed with the image on this ring. All right? That's how he sealed it. Okay. Well, that, that um, letter was uh, very happily received by the family. And they passed it around. Look, William's not dead. Look what happened. And one of the family friends was a guy by the name of William Shakespeare, a playwright. He was inspired by reading about the hurricane to write a play called The Tempest. So The Tempest was inspired by the image uh, by, uh, that was on the letter he, well, by the letter that he read that had this image on it. I mean, that's, how cool is that get? Uh, that, that was from the archaeology. And they have found a million and a half such artifacts. I don't know if you've been following the news lately, but they've come up with some brand new stuff that's really kind of uh, gruesome, but it's, uh, we knew about it from the writings of the people who were there. You remember that awful uh, starving time? If you got nothing to eat, you do things you might not ordinarily do. Have, did any of you see this in the news? Uh, we had accounts in the, written, in the written words of these actual people that there had been cannibalism there. Well, the archaeologists in uh, uh, just recent times discovered human remains that obviously had been subject to the flesh being removed uh, and uh, for consumption. I mean, it's very gruesome, but it's, it's new stuff uh, in the, the archaeological discoveries. Um, they're, they're really coming up with some uh, amazing stuff. For a long time, they didn't even think they had the fort. They thought the river, James River, had... Uh, eroded the bank there and taken the fort away. And uh, the National Park Service that did a lot of the interpretation there was, was saying, yeah, the fort was over there in the water, about 100 yards. Well, in reality, uh, when the, the archaeology was begun, they found that, yeah, the fort has been washed away. 15% is gone. If you can do your math, that means 85% of that fort's still there, and they've just had, they've had a, 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 an incredible time. I hope you have a chance to, to put your feet on that dirt, which is the starting of this country uh, at some point. Now, this country is not perfect. It never was, all right? The humans uh, weren't perfect. They had flaws. They had problems. Uh, the people here at Porkfest probably know some of those problems that we have far better than a lot of people do. But in reality, what this place is owes its existence to the struggle that took place at Jamestown. And it is worth seeing that. It is worth seeing the lessons they learned about the ownership of private property, about uh, perhaps it's better instead of to receive uh, commands from a monarch that's 3,000 miles away, maybe we ought to make our own decisions over here. 
You know, this, this is, these are important steps. They're not perfection. Now, we have received, our, we worked up to perfection today in 2013, haven't we? Uh, we, we may have slipped a bit. Who knows? But the, the, the point is, this is very important uh, history and so forth. Now, you may have some questions. I don't want to ramble on forever and ever. Uh, if you have any particular questions, I'd love to, to uh, try to answer as best I can. I, I love uh, showing the uh, early history and the lessons they learned because they are relevant to us today. We can really avoid a lot of trouble if we know what trouble others have had and what happened. If you have a question, if you could just speak into the mic, I'm going to hand it to you. Thanks, Dick. That's great. Um, what kind of uh, law, internal laws did they have, especially during the starving time? How did they, how did they function as a, as a society within, the, within those walls? Um, th that's a good question. Um, it, this was a, a little different sort of uh, experiment. This was not a, a king's, even though the king, uh, the people who, who arrived there had their allegiance to the king. And, and he, he, if he pulled the plug on things, if he said, uh, we, we canceled your charter, uh, it, it ends. But it was a, it was a for-profit um, stockholders corporation. The Virginia Company had stockholders. Matter of fact, John Rolfe's brother, Henry Rolfe, was a stockholder in the, in the Virginia Company. They'd bought stock in it. So the king allowed the company to do pretty much what they wanted in the area that he said that they could, could uh, go to because the Spanish hadn't used it. They hadn't possessed it. And so the English were uh, eager to push the Spanish out as much as they could. So anyway, uh, the, the company had their authority. And so what they did was, in the very beginning, they said, uh, we're going to send a list of seven names in a box. Um, and uh, we're going to give this box to you, the, the, the head ship's captain. That was uh, Captain Christopher Newport. They put that box in his custody, and, and they told him, do not open this box until you get to Virginia, because at sea, you, the captain, are God. Uh, you're, you command life and death at sea, and we do not want these high-born gentlemen here trying to usurp your authority on the ocean. They will, so don't open that box. So Newport got him over there, and he had this ceremony um, uh, where he called everybody together, and he said, now I'm going to open this box. Do you remember Captain John Smith was in shackles by that time he was a prisoner? Well, they were going to execute him. They open up the box, and there are seven names they, they pull out who are going to be on, a, on the council. The council then will vote on their, to, to elect their president. And that's the initial leadership and how they were structured governmentally in the very beginning. Guess who one of the names was that came out of the box? Captain John Smith. You think there was a grin on his face? The guy who was going to be executed, they couldn't, that's why he wasn't executed. Because, uh, he, by the way, uh, he was accused of, of, of trying to mutiny the crew on, the, on the, the crossing. Now, he said he was innocent, but he was the kind of, he was a kind of, a, you know, a knowledgeable, experienced, pushy sort of guy. And he was probably saying, you guys are going to get us killed here. We're sitting here for a month and a half. We haven't gone anywhere. Don't you know? You know he was probably doing that. And they took that as mutiny, attempting to mutiny the crew, and that carries with it a, you know, an execution. Well, anyways, a long story short, they, they got him over here to execute him, and his name was in the box he was going to be on the council. Well, obviously, the council didn't elect him as president, but that's how they started their leadership. Now, as time went along, the, uh, and problems came up and so forth, uh, uh, word got back about this problem, and, it, you know, it, it, remember, correcting a problem meant at least, you know, about three months, the word going over, some negotiation and planning over there, and then maybe three months coming back. That's six months before you get an answer. Nothing happened quickly. And so they were struggling along with this, this type of uh, organization for a long time. Eventually, the company appointed a governor that they sent over. But uh, then uh, they elected, uh, in 1619, they started their general assembly because it was too hard to get word back and forth and this, that, and the other. They needed to make decisions right there, you know, immediate decisions about what's going on in the colony. So they, they created this uh, general assembly, all right? They elected their own. And um, that, that body, by the way, 
exists to this very day. It is the oldest democratic body, democratically elected body, in continuous existence in the world. The Virginia General Assembly is that group of settlers, uh, started in 1619, that elected their own. Um, it, that's something significant. If you have an interest in, in democracy or democratic type governments, democratic republics and so forth, that is really unusual. So anyway, this, this body began to make the laws. Uh, but the governor still had a lot of authority. Now, something happened in 1621, uh, 22 to change everything. Uh, and this really uh, throws a kink in, in, uh, in the, the growth of the colony. Um, John Rolfe got sick. He wrote a will. That's why I do uh, 21 and not 22. Uh, and um, he disappears from the record. The history books tell you that he died in a massacre that happened on the 22nd of March of 1622. Uh, the Powhatan Indians at that point said, enough. Powhatan was dead by that time, and his half-brother, Opakankanu, was the new chief. And Opakankanu never trusted the English. I don't know why. He, he thought that if, if, you, uh, if you let them keep coming, they'll take it all. You know, that's what he thought. Uh, and, and he said that if, if we let this keep happening, uh, you know, well, he said, if we're going to change things, we have to do it while we are in the majority. We can't wait until there are so many English here that we can't do anything about it. So he was looking for a sign to, to shift from the peace that had been established because of Pocahontas and Rolf marrying under Powhatan and what he wanted to do. Well, Pocahontas died in England in 1617 on the trip they made there. Powhatan died in 1618. And Rolf, we have now found, the history books are wrong, Rolf died in early 22. He wrote a will. He was sick. He was probably trying to make, make it back to see his son that they left in England. Pocahontas and his son w was left there. Well, well he died. And uh, the new chief, Opakankanu, said, that's a sign. That's the last link that, that, was, was, that the, the peace was built upon. So he said, okay, it's over. And in one day, uh, there was a coordinated attack on about 1,100 settlers, and, and 371 died in one day. That's a nuclear attack on the U.S. That's big. That is a real big attack. It would have been bigger if the word hadn't uh, began to filter out here and there, and some of the settlements were warned in advance. But um, that's, with that process, when the word finally got back to England about the massacre, the king said, oh, my gosh. Don't you guys know what you're doing? How bad is your leadership there? Do you have any security? Uh, can't you run this? You know what I'm going to do? I'm jerking your charter. The charter had been given by the king in 1606. Uh, and so the king says, your charter's revoked. You, Virginia Company, you don't exist anymore. Guess what? The colony's mine. By that time, of course, tobacco was a profitable venture. Can you see what's going on here? Uh, it, it, none of this is, is strange or weird, but that's how the, the government's uh, structure altered and changed a little bit. The governor, uh, when he was uh, like Sir Thomas Dale, for example, he had, he had immense authority and he was very severe. Uh, and eventually that modified as things got better and they put in the, the new charter that had the General Assembly and they started you know, modifying the laws uh, a bit. But they, they went through some real hills and valleys. It was not a smooth transition to what, what, be, what eventually became. But that General Assembly uh, uh, became the same group of people that in Williamsburg, only six miles away, you know, some of you have heard of Colonial Williamsburg, um, uh, families like, uh, like uh, people like uh, Thomas Jefferson, Patrick Henry, James Madison, uh, 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 George Wythe, uh, George Mason, uh, uh, George Washington, uh, some rather significant uh, inspirational founding fathers, they were the grandsons of these people, who, and, and they were also members of the Virginia General Assembly when it was meeting in Williamsburg. The capital moved from Jamestown to Williamsburg in 1699, and then to Richmond, where it is now. 
Well, um, they continued to have their original uh, belief in their English rights because the king had told them, just because you go to uh, America from England, you don't lose your rights as an Englishman. And by, by the common law and by the Magna Carta, they'd already achieved certain rights, such as the right of juries uh, of their peers and, and, and uh, parliamentary system and all that. That was already well established. And the king said, that is yours. You know, I'm not taking that away just because you're not living in England. You have all those rights. And these people kept that idea. They, one of the ideas was you can't be obligated by a government in which you are not represented. No taxation without representation. You, you have no obligation uh, to a law uh, created by a body in which you're not represented. And in the revolutionary times, um, there weren't any Virginians in Parliament or any New Yorkers or any Marylanders. They, they weren't there, of course. So they said, well, we don't have any obligation to pay that tax. We don't have anybody there. Nobody speaks for us. And so they were demanding their English rights. That, that is a large part of what the American Revolution um, was all about because these Englishmen were demanding English rights. And they said, they pointed to England and said, you've forgotten who you are. You've forgotten what your liberties were. People never forget their liberties, do they? No, never happens. Uh, well, um, they forgot, they, the Virginians accused the English of, of forgetting who they were, that they were distinctly different than the Spanish or the French or the Dutch or others and so forth. Uh, and they demanded their rights, and that's, you know, to make a long story short, the American Revolution comes from that. I mean, there's a lot more to it, and there's so much complexity involved in it, but that's the simplicity of it. That's the reality under the bottom. Uh, I'm sorry, that question went for way, uh, that was a good short question and the answer was way too long. Uh, uh, may, uh, do we have time for one more or not? I mean, if there's somebody else coming in. Uh, uh, another question or two? Uh, 20 minutes? Okay. Uh, you don't have to stay for, <laughs> for, for any of this, but um, uh, this is an unusual method of prep uh, uh, presentation. Um, I, I spoke yesterday in regular clothes, and I'll speak tomorrow in regular clothes on citizen leadership. But this is a different way to present that, that uh, uh, involves accurate history. I'm not making any of this stuff up. You, I, I, I read you the thing from Ralph Hammer that's, that some of this is based upon. Uh, it's not magic. Um, but it's a different way to present that hopefully there's a, a, a little entertainment value, but that's not why I'm interested. I'm interested in the ideas and what it has to, to offer us today in terms of how we solve our problems and approach challenges and so forth. Uh, there's a lot of really good stuff there. This story is a fascinating story. It's got everything you want in, a, 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 in an exciting story. And the best, um, I think the best book on this is one written by the people who were there. There's a book called Jamestown Narratives. It's about that thick, about a thousand pages. And it is everything written by anybody who was actually at Jamestown. Rolf is in there. Smith is in there. Uh, Ralph Hammer's in there. Gabriel Archer. Uh, there, there are a whole bunch. It's called Jamestown Narratives. A buddy of mine uh, edited that book. Uh, his name is Edward Wright Hale. He's a character. If ever, uh, Ed ought to be lecturing up here. Uh, he's a, a really neat guy and an interesting character. Uh, he just read, by the way, uh, David Stockman's book. Have any of you heard about that? He just read Stockman's book, and he said what I'd been telling him for a long time. He finally, he didn't believe me, but he believed Stockman. So anyway, um, about the economy here. So, uh, but Ed wrote that, and it's got uh, the actual words of the people who are at Jamestown. Now, they differ among themselves. They differ describing Jamestown. They're describing the same place. They're just describing it as different individuals. You know, they saw it in different ways because their values were not identical. Their perceptions were somewhat different of, of it. And that's really healthy to read that. And if you read that, uh, you don't have to go to a, to a, uh, a historian who's read it and, and has Im imposed his or her own values upon the original words. You get the original words yourself. Those people are talking to you. So that's my favorite book about Jamestown, the Jamestown Narratives. Really fabulous book. Um, because you're actually talking with those guys. Um, hi, Dick. This has been wonderful. I have a question. I'm wondering if the Jamestown experience uh, in any way pointed to answers to the questions of what are the pros and cons of different sizes of governance, of self-governance. 
Yeah. A different group of 50 people, 100 people, 700 people, yeah. et cetera. That, that is a very good question. Um, one, uh, I should probably start by saying one reason they did what they did in the beginning. Okay, many of us thought, w would think, well, gosh, that sounds stupid that they would do that and fail so much. Uh, well, uh, they, they sent the gentleman because of the knowledge about what happened with the Spanish. But the, in terms of the, the form of government that they had, uh, this was very much like a military expedition being set down into a hostile land, like if you were going to helicopter Americans into Afghanistan. You wouldn't expect them to feed themselves. You supply them, okay? But uh, in theory, you don't keep them there in that circumstance forever. Uh, now, wars end right away when, when we're told that wars are short, right? They don't go longer than what they're supposed to. Never. It couldn't happen. Well, sometimes it drags out and drags out and drags out and you get a bad situation. Well, you, you can't expect... They were not expecting to have to supply them forever. But they, in the beginning, they did that just because that's the way it was. But as time went along, if this was going to be a permanent situation, they were going to have to feed themselves. Now, now the government imposed upon that. Um, the, the problem uh, with the government was the, the government, in a sense, was... Self-government. Self yeah, now that doesn't, uh, you don't really get the good, healthy self-government until 1619. Before that, it's, it's a council, or it's, it's a governor sent by the, the investors. It, it's imposed, and very severely. They, people were put to death for all sorts of things. Um, it was very severe. And so, so the government had been uh, oppressively heavy and huge, until 1619 when they began, they got a new charter. There were actually three charters in the early years. And they got a, when they began realizing, when, when the company was hearing how bad things were going at times, they said, you know, we do need to change. And in 1618, uh, in preparation for 19, uh, they put a new charter out that was much more liberal and said, okay, we're going to let these people decide for themselves a few things. We're not going to impose everything upon them. We're going to or have a governor to impose everything on them. We're going to let them make their own choices. Things. They'll know better what to do than we will. They, they know the immediate answer. So it began to lessen. The government began to actually shrink. Um, and, uh, and people began to live much more profitable and less oppressive lives when they began to make choices for themselves in 1619. You can see a transition. Uh, the optimism in, uh, increases. Um, and so they were allowed to do uh, a lot more things because they were making decisions themselves. Um, and, um, and so things, uh, there was a lot less stick and a lot more carrot uh, after 1619. Uh, but the government was big in the sense that it was totally imposed upon them in the early years. They didn't really have any choice. They, they signed up to go, but that was it. <laughs> Once you got here, uh, it was big government. <laughs> like the commander of a military detachment in a foreign land. <laughs> it, it was that sort of situation. But if it was going to continue, it had to, it had to change. It, it just could not remain a tyranny, an absolute tyranny forever. Uh, some called uh, uh, Governor Thomas Dale an absolute tyrant. A, a wise and just one, but an absolute tyrant. And, and many were put to death for all kinds of things. They, the punishments were horrible. You know, I, I don't even want to go into some of the details of the punishments, but there was a lot of corporal punishment. You might have a, 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 a peg put through your tongue for saying a bad word, you know, a big peg, you know. And, uh, you, you might be uh, tied to a tree uh, and uh, left there forever. Um, some of the Indian punishments were pretty severe too. But um, anyway, yeah, the, the government got less after 1619 in a, in a major way, and, and things got better. People had optimism. They were willing to come. They were beginning to be willing to come. And then, of course, that darn you know, massacre happened, and things got bad again. How do we get to a place where... Um, and this is particularly relevant in Canada, 
We're the natives are the good people. They've always been good. And we've always been bad. Because this infuses all our politics in Canada, and I don't know much about what's going on in the States. Right. Well, um, in, in point of fact, um, as I was talking about before, uh, the native people, the Powhatans, were just as willing to use uh, slaughter <laughs> to take what they wanted as anybody. Um, if you have a power structure, and if you have people following you like warriors who are willing to do what you tell them to do, you as a, as a leader say, well, I can do this. I can, they've got wealth over there, I'm going to take it. When, when you concentrate power, it gives the person controlling that power a lot of latitude, and then human nature takes over. Uh, I, I don't know as much about the history of the native people in, in uh, Canada, uh, but, but if the power had been diffused and there wasn't a, a person who said, okay, kill all those people over there, where people would do what he said, then, you know, it, it might have been a different situation. Uh, virtue, uh, virtue comes, has to do with our choices and actions. We're not born virtuous or, or evil. Uh, Adolf Hitler was a real pretty little baby. He was a cute little baby. You know, uh, 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 virtue or lack of virtue comes from the choices we eventually adopt and our values. That's what, you know, that's what it really is all about. It's, it's, it's proven, good or bad is proven by, what, by history and what you can see happen. But humans have a tendency to, uh, to uh, abuse power when they can. If, if I can, I will. If I can't, I won't. You know, that sort of attitude. Um, unless you have a, a, a set of values that refuses that. And the people here, most of the people here at Porkfest do not believe that the end justifies the means. I want that bad enough so I can do anything to get it. They don't believe that. They don't believe that. Because that is the seed that grows into the worst abuses that humans have ever experienced. The end justifies the means. Some politician, some leader, some Indian chief, some, some colonial leader is going to say, this is so important that if you don't do it, you'll die. And if you don't make me leader and you, if you don't crush that Indian camp over there, they're going to kill us all. If you believe that, well, I mean, some of that may be true, some not. You know, I'm not arguing the details of a, a situation. But the point is, if you let the the uh, ends draw you into any method, then you will be drawn into the method of theft, threats, and force. Uh, if you believe that the end justifies the means. Uh, uh, certainly there, uh, there are important ends that we all seek and they're common. The, the, the same uh, ends that, that are desired by a socialist, a capitalist, a, 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 a fascist, the same ends as a human being generally are the same ends. Survival, prosperity, you know, for my family and me. That, that's a common end. We all want that. But how you go about getting it is the difference. So, so that's, I think that's it. And, and some, uh, some Indian tribes were more peaceful and some were less. Even, even in Powhatan's dominion. Powhatan was not the commander of a tribe. But I should quickly uh, cover this. Uh, uh, when we speak of the Powhatans, when Powhatan was born, he inherited six, the leadership of six tribes. By the time he died, he had 34. And the new ones didn't join voluntarily. Okay? Anybody who calls it a confe uh, the uh, Powhatan Confederation doesn't know what they're talking about. It was the Powhatan Dominion. He was a king. And, and he, he was a dominant. Pocahontas's, Pocahontas had many uh, brothers and sisters. Over 30 of them. Powhatan commanded 30-some uh, tribes. Each one had a king called a Werowance. A Werowance means the leader of a tribe in the Powhatan, uh, among the Powhatans. Well, he commanded all of them. And he would take a wife from each tribe. He would take a wife, have a child from that tribe, send the, the woman back, and take a, a, a woman from another tribe, have a child, send her back, and so on. And this was one of the ways he uh, glued the dominion together. So all of Pocahontas' brothers and sisters were half-brothers and sisters. But I mean, that was part of his uh, method of, of uh, keeping it all together and dominating and so forth. Uh, but uh, again, uh, not all the Indians 
were the same. And, and, and in Canada, it may have been a very different situation. Uh, what, <laughs> humans are humans are humans. Um, but uh, uh, one of the reasons that Powhatan said there's going to be peace, you know, when Rolf and Pocahontas married, was a self-serving r- reason. Humans do things for, for, for their benefit. Surprise, surprise. One, uh, several of the reasons that he chose to, to stop the war and have, have peace were, one, um, the English were a source of metal. The Powhatan Indians, their tools were, st- were stones, Shells, wood, and the bones of animals. They had no metal tools. They took down trees that big for their canoes without an axe or a saw of metal. Talk about labor. They didn't have any metal. They were Stone Age people. Well, so having an ally of the English gave them an ally with swords and knives and firearms and so forth. And Powhatan had enemies among uh, the... Iroquoian-speaking people and the Suan-speaking people, these, these uh, Powhatans were Algonquin-speaking people. That, that was the language group. A lot, much of the East Coast, I, I suspect the Indians around here, were Algonquin-speaking people. That was the same as Powhatans. But, but very close by were Iroquoians and, and uh, Suans, and they were vicious enemies. And, um, and Powhatan may have wanted a source of metal, you know, metal tools and weapons and so forth, and a powerful ally to fight with them. Um, and so that may have been some of his thinking as to why he, he, he made a peace with them for that period of time anyway. Um, uh, we're probably running out of time. I'll, I'll chat with individuals for as long as you want to talk, but uh, uh, I, I want to thank you very, very much for listening to this uh, little early history of our country. This really is uh, uh, the seed that becomes what you and I know. It's the seed. It is where, where private property for the common man, not just for the wealthy, uh, becomes uh, an acceptable and common and possible thing. It is where representative government gets its start. It's, it's where problems between the races begin. Uh, 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 John Rolfe was the journalist, the guy who actually wrote about the arrival of the first Africans that came into uh, the colony in 16 and 19. Um, they came in as slaves from a Spanish uh, slave ship, and they were, uh, the English uh, were being asked, it was a Dutch ship, they'd probably been preying upon Spanish treasure ships going across the ocean, they they got these slaves, they didn't need the slaves, they needed food and water, so they came to the English colony and they said, hey you guys, we're not at war with you right now, will you give us food and, and, and water for these Africans here, you can have them. 20 of them got off at Jamestown, food went on, the Dutch ship left. Well, England didn't have any slavery at the time. It was, it was not legal. You could not own slaves. So what were these Africans? They became, from the Spanish treasure ship, I mean, tra- Spanish slave ship, they, where they were slaves, they became indentured servants to the English to pay off the debt of the water and the food. And when they'd worked through that indenture, four to seven years, whatever it was, they were free. And that's in the record. There was no real chattel slavery until about the 1660s for another reason. But these Africans became just as much freeholders as anyone else. They, later on, they had indentured servants who they had contract with. It's in, in the, the record. So that's a fascinating thing. John Rolfe is the journalist, so to speak, who reports that. And the, the sad thing is that if you read about Jamestown, it's all Captain John Smith. It's all Pocahontas, and Pocahontas is very important. Uh, John Smith is very important. I don't deny that, but nobody talks about John Rolfe. The guy who brought a prophet, the entrepreneur who brought a prophet, saved the colony, the guy who was a member of the first General Assembly, uh, and the guy who married Pocahontas and stopped the fighting. I mean, he didn't, his, his purpose wasn't, by marrying her, his purpose wasn't to stop the fighting. His purpose was romance and, and so forth. That's in the record also, but the consequence was peace. So Rolf is a kingpin in this history, and you can't understand it without him, but people who don't believe in, in market concepts as much don't value what he did as much. They think swinging a sword is more important. Rolf wasn't made famous by swinging a sword. He had a sword, he just didn't swing it much. So anyway, there's that. But thank you so much. You've been uh, very kind to, to uh, listen to this long presentation, and I'll chat with you later. Lay your head down Hear 
here beside me The rain can't reach us here It's safe and dry The silence is a season All its own this morning 